send I'll send you a message. But the bottom line is um, Tuesday's the last day for any homework. You can su submit anything. I'll take it up to two. But at, that's it. A week Tuesday next week. Yeah. Okay. And remember, I drop. You don't have to submit one if you don't want to. Well, I thought I included you guys in. I guess I didn't. <sighs> okay, I think it's twelve. I think it's time. <laughs> Uh, so we've been talking about the two-dimensional wave, wave equation, standard wave equation extended to two dimensions, and a natu the natural system to first consider is membranes, it's like a two-dimensional string. And we'll be encountering this next quarter in sound. Uh, and we found for Circular, this is for circular geometry where the membrane's fixed around the rim here. Displacement is zero. We found these standing wave modes. Uh, this represents the, the, the fundamental, the uniform mode. It's just going like this, okay? There's no, there are no interior nodes. We have these as mutually symmetric modes. These modes do not depend upon angle. At any point in time, if you change the angle, you're always going to see the same displacement, no matter what it is. Okay, so those correspond to m equals zero Bessel functions. And here are the, the J1 Bessel functions. This is the, these are out of phase by 90 degrees, by, excuse me, 180 degrees, these shaded and unshaded regions. And it, this just goes on classically forever. Now what we want to do next is we're going to focus on the azimuthally symmetric modes. And the reason is, and we're looking ahead a little bit to next quarter here, but I think, I think it's a good thing. We want to um, look at the connection of these, these membrane modes with sound. Okay, this could be a microphone membrane receiving sound. If a sound wave comes in, it's going to excite this the membrane here. Or it could be uh, transmitting, this works both ways, it's what we call reciprocal. This could be emitting sounds. It's a little easier to think of uh, the, let me talk in the context of sound emission here. This thing going like this, changing, it's going to change the pressure in the air, it's going to send out a sound wave, right? Now there's a fundamental difference between the sound waves you get from here and for the rest of these. So you look at this, this is, this is going like this, it's going to send out sound. This one is, let me do it this way. So this one is kind of going like this. What's this doing? What's going to happen here? Now to, to understand this, you need to, to realize something here. Typically, for typical membranes, the speed of sound in the, in the, in the fluid here is going to air, whatever is going to be much greater than the speed of waves on the membrane. So what that means is the wavelength of the sound created here is large, typically, is large compared to the source here. So what happens when I have a source doing this? What do you think physically? What's going to happen here? This is creating a compression, right, that will propagate out. We're going to derive all this next quarter. But what is this creating at this an expansion? That propagates too. And you can see that they tend to cancel. Yeah. When the wavelength is large, they're going to tend to cancel. This is not going to be an efficient radiator. So we're going to spend a huge amount of time next quarter focusing on what we call the monopole. This is a monopole case here because we get a volume change. Now I'm assuming that we've enclosed it in the back. Let's not worry about that right now. Let's just focus our attention out here, okay? We'll talk about that later. So this is a monopole. This is called, you see the sort of plus and minus, call it a dipole source. What's this? Take a wild guess. Quadrupole source. So we have two demonstrations, I, I'm, at least two, I, where you will, I'll demonstrate this for you. You'll hear it. You know, you'll hear a sound here, and then we'll flip to here, we'll go to here, you'll, 
you'll hear the drop in amplitude. There's a serious drop in amplitude. So it's for this reason, we're, as, and you'll see as we go along in the, cal the several calculations we're going to do, we're going to focus on the azimuthally symmetric modes. So these are the m equals zero modes. These are the modes, the key geometrical thing here is that when this mode is out here at some, some amplitude, we characterize it by the amplitude, the maximum amplitude at the origin right here. There's a volume change, right? What's the volume change here? By symmetry, it's zero. This one's coming out, this one's going in by the same amount. So the first thing we're going to do here is calculate the volume change for the m is equal to zero modes. Oh, do you think it cancels? It, it competes here. This one's out. This area is out. This is in. Do you think they're going to exactly cancel? No, no. These are, you know, these are Bessel functions that are solutions to the wave equation. They could care less about what the average displacement is. It, so it's, it's, it would be a very strange thing. It's, there's no connection there. And we'll calculate that and we'll see that indeed they're not zero. So let's do that. Oh, the first thing I want to point out to you, um, we're going to drop, because we're focusing on m is equal to zero, I'm going to drop the m is equal to zero um, subscript. I think we had it here just before the zero. There was, there's an m here. So this is, we're assuming this is all for m is equal to zero. So there's no reason in carrying along the subscripts. You know, k should be k0n, we're going to drop the zero. j should be jm0, we're going to drop that. And similar with the frequencies. And you remember here that um, the normal modes, this is for a fixed membrane, are given by, um, when you substitute the radius here, this has to be zero to get the boundary condition, a fi the fixed boundary condition. So the frequencies are specified, omega is equal to ck, and k has to satisfy k times n is equal to a zero of the Bessel function, of the m is equal to zero Bessel function. And here are the, the zeros here. So each one of these corresponds to a different mode. Uh, and the frequencies we get, because omega is equal to ck, excuse me, the frequencies are going to be given by this. This is easy to show. And you want to notice something here, and this will be this will come up later on today if we get to it, if not first thing tomorrow. These ratios are not integers. If you look at the ratio of the frequency of the nth mode here to the fundamental, um, you can just tell by looking at it, they're not integers. So this, so why is that important? Well, there's, there's a couple of reasons. One, I just want to mention one. Musically, it's not real good. It's not going to sound real good to us. We like to f hear harmonics of things. All right, now why is that? I have no idea. That's like psychoacoustics or, so I don't know what it is, but I don't know. But I can tell you that it's true, <laughs> okay? So we'll come back and I'll make a comment about this later. Well, we, we summarize this by saying the overtones um, are not these higher modes compared to the fundamental, they're not in um, simple integer relations, they're not harmonics, the overtones are not harmonics. Uh, and incidentally, I mentioned this I think last, kind of quickly last week, let me mention it again here. Um, there's a node right here, it has a certain radius, less than a. You can calculate, it's not difficult to calculate, and you do it, by noting here's the fundamental mode and it can only be zero at the rim when k is equal to a. The, um, when r is equal to a, okay, this is for the fundamental k. For the next mode up, it behaves like this and it's going to vanish, that's how we find k2, at, at a it's gonna, going to vanish. But this k is, is bigger, this is still the same function, j0 here. Okay, it's just different arguments. This K2 is bigger than K1, so as you increase R from the origin, you go outward, eventually, you're gonna reach a point here that you're gonna find some R where this value is going to be equal to K1A, because K2 is bigger than K1, and we're at an R less than, they're gonna balance here, and that's gonna be where the node is. Okay, so that's how you find the nodes.
And I guess we didn't do this in a, did we do this in a problem? Is that where I'm thinking we saw this quickly? Yes. At the end? Okay. Yeah, okay. So yeah, it's, it's just a good thing to know. And so why am I emphasizing it? I don't know, it's just my intuition. I think it's because it's gonna come up next quarter now that I think about it. When we do the modes in a cylindrical enclosure. So you'll be comparing the Bessel function theory to the actual measurements with a microphone that you're scanning the sound field. So I don't know, it's just a good thing to know. You can find, you can find these interior nodal circles in this case. Uh, okay, let me see if I have any other extra comments here. All right, so the, what we want to do now is, this is what I was just talking about before. What, thinking of this as a sound emitter, it's, the strength of it is going to be characterized, characterized by how much displacement we have, the net displacement, whatever mode we're talking about here. Um, the bigger that displacement is, the greater the amplitude of the sound is going to be. So that's the key quantity here is to find the average displacement amplitude. So remember psi here is our transverse displacement from equilibrium and we're going to find the average of this value over the surface of the membrane, over the, this circular membrane here. So to get the average we multiply, this is the amplitude, you know, the maximum value at, at, the turning, at a turning point with this amplitude here. We're going to multiply that by the little surface, element of surface area, and integrate this over the entire surface, and then divide by the total surface area. That's going to be the average of this quantity here, right? Um, and of course, we have azimuthal symmetry, so we're going to take this ds to be a little ring going around, right? Since we have azimuthal symmetry here, when we do our integration, it's technically a double integral. But, um, and we've seen this kind of thing before, it's technically a double integral, but what I want to do is turn it into, do this integration about this ring first. That results, it'll be some dr right here. Okay, and the area of this ring, because the sound amplitude, excuse me, the displacement amplitude is the same by symmetry all around this ring. So when I'm multiplying by a little bit of area here, I'm going to choose the area of this ring. That's going to give me one of my integrals, and then I have to do a second integral over R. So the ds here is going to be, this is a thin ring, so its area is this distance times the circumference. And that wh that's why the circumference is sitting right there. You can see the circumference. So we've already actually done one integration. That's nice. Um, and now we've got to do a second integration. And now this is where this bad feeling comes about in, for a lot of students when they first hit Bessel functions. You know, how do I integrate a Bessel function? Well, again, Bessel functions are... Uh, oh, I don't know if I told you this, but they're just one of many examples of what are called special functions of mathematical physics. So if you're taking 3991, has some of you, who's had 3991? We have a math physical, uh, uh, mathematical physics course here. Every physics department has a mathematical physics course, okay? And you go through and you look at properties of math, of not just Bessel functions, but many special functions of mathematical physics. And they have tons of properties. You would not believe all the properties. So part of the experience that you're going to find today is we're going to hit one right here. You might wonder, how do we do this integral? Well, the first thing we do is we put it in dimensionless form, right? I'm going to call this x, or x is a dimensionless variable. And I'm going to transform r and theta. I just, it's just a scaling, and I have to scale the integration. So this is elementary. I'm going to this dimensionless variable here, x is equal to knr, and so now I have a, um, a purely you know, dimensionless integration that I have to do here. Okay, and I've got these extra factors that have appeared here because of my transformation of the variable. So how do we do x j0 of x? Well, what <laughs> one of the things, my generation would open up Abramowitz and Stegen. Okay, there's this classic book. These two people who had worked in a federal 
I think it was the national, called then the National Bureau of Standards. And um, this, this is what everyone calls it, a bra, uh, it's probably Abramowitz. And Stegen or Stegen. Has anyone ever heard of this before? It's, yeah, it's a, our PhD student has. It's available online now, someone told me a few years ago. But my generation, we all have a Dover reprint. Everybody, my generation, has a Dover reprint in their bookcase. Okay, and it's about this thick. And it goes through a ton of mathematical physics, including Bessel functions, and just lists all the properties. So this is where we run to, okay, when you, and you know, you, you do what, I don't know, but all I, all I can tell you is they took the time to uh, do a, to really flesh out a lot of the properties of, of special functions of mathematical physics. And so, um, and you can quick, pretty quickly find, once you get used to it a little bit, you can go in there and find out some of these, and here's one of them. I'm not going to believe this. But, uh, you know, the derivative of the sine is what? A cosine. a cosine. Okay, we don't think about that very much, but it's a property of, of sinusoids, right? Well, a property of Bessel functions is the derivative of x times j1 of x happens to be x times j0. It's exact. It's one of the many properties of Bessel functions, which is just one example of many special functions of mathematical physics. They're not, they're beyond, the special functions are beyond the simple elementary functions that we deal with, okay? So you can see this is made to order, this identity is made to order because we can now integrate this exactly, right? This is an antiderivative. So here it is, there's the average displacement. It involves, the average displacement of these J0 modes, these azimuthally symmetric modes, involves a J1 function. And this is not the only time we're going to see this. We're going to see it again today, and uh, next quarter we're going to see it at least once, I can remember. So it's just something like anything you, you get used to. You know, I'm dealing with these special functions. It's, we're lucky that, you know, that all these properties have been, it was like real popular, I think, in the 1800s for applied mathematicians to just, oh look, here's another property. Let's put it in the book, or whatever they did, you know. And um, so there's a tremendous amount of knowledge about the, the properties of these functions. My properties, I mean relation, mathematical relationships. Those are the bulk of the properties here. And we'll encounter some more today. Um, incidentally, I want to point out to you here, this is all for m is equal to zero. What do we, what do we have to get when we, when we don't have m equals zero? when I do that integral? Zero. It's got to be zero. And in fact, you can see why it is. You're going to have a cosine of m theta here where m is not equal to zero. And when you do that theta integration, it's going to be zero. So no matter what m is, as long as it's not zero. So you're going to get zero for all those. Uh, let's look at the fundamental first. It's equal to this. So we need to evaluate j1 at this root of j0, this is a root of j0 here. So it's a number, you punch this in, and here's what you get. It's, a rough, it's roughly 43% of the, of the uh, maximum amplitude. So if we look at a side view here of the membrane, so this is a side view of the membrane done like this. It's fixed out here. Here's the axis of symmetry. And we're calling this, this is our amplitude. Which are we calling this A1? Okay, this is the amp, yeah. This is the fundamental mode. So the, the average displacement is sitting somewhere here, a little less than that, roughly halfway a little less than halfway, right? So, this is the average of the displacement here. That means, a, a better way of looking at it is this volume right here is the same volume of this cylinder here when we're using this effective height. That's equivalent. That's, that's a better way of thinking of the result rather than in terms of the average displacement is go to volume. 
So this will turn out to be very useful for us next quarter. So let me try to get this idea in your head. This thing is going to be emitting sound. If we have a fluid here, it's going to be emitting sound. If the wavelength is large, we lose the details of exactly what's going on here. And the only thing that's important for a monopole source, okay, we're vo a source that's where the volume is changing, that's, sort of, uh, that's what we mean by a monopole source. The only thing that's important when the volume is changing is not the details of the actual structure here, when the wavelength of sound is large, it's just the volume. So I can replace this with a piston. And we can calculate a piston. That's a famous calculation that we're going to go through. It's not easy, but it can be done in terms of special functions. Uh, see, is that true? Well, we'll find out next quarter. They get involved. Okay, I'm wrong. Um, we won't need the special functions. In the limit of long wavelength, we don't need the special functions. But we'll be doing the piston for any, it's such an important problem. It can be done for any wavelength of sound. So it doesn't have to be large wavelengths. So the particular case of a piston, that's something that can be explicitly solved for any wavelengths. And it's, and if, if, um, do you think it's going to involve special functions? Oh yeah. Yeah, and, I, and I, I can't remember what they are, but they're not all Bessel functions. We'll see that next quarter. Um, look at the second mode here. When you do this for, when we look at the result here, for the second mode, we put in K2 is negative. What does that mean? The average displacement's negative? Well, we're assuming this, this is a positive. We're assuming this is positive, and so this has to be negative, and the negative beats out the positive here. You, you know, this, this disk would have to be pretty far out here. It's not that far out to, to beat out the negative part. So, the membrane here is out, here it's in. The actual volume change is, is you know, displacement is that way. It's a negative volume change. If you're gonna call this a positive volume change, it's a negative volume change. So that's why we have a negative number here. The other thing you want to notice is, look at the amplitude. Forget the positive or negative. Compare these two. What do you see? This one's all substantially bigger, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, there's competition here. There's competition here. The, for the average displacement, this, this positive is competing with a negative displacement. Here, there's, it's all, all to, same direction. So we'd expect to see that, especially as you go, we'd expect these numbers, these average displacements, to fall off as you go higher because you get more and more competition here as you go that way, and that's what happens. That's why we're seeing this smaller. Where is it? Right there. Now what I've done is, we've already talked about this, I just, I think this should have been, I'd like to, I, I, this should be up front, so what we were talking about before, um, it's, it's all, it's, it's here. I just decided to put it up front because it's, it's motivation. Okay, any questions so far? So we're going to take this a step further, and this is a, this is interesting, and it's a, it's a, we're going to do a calculation, and it's a challenging calculation, but it's very interesting, and it has a big surprise at the end. Uh, so I don't know, I'm sure KFCS debated whether they should put it in here. It's going to involve sound, we just can't, you know. It, Um, it's been difficult not to deal with sound in this course, even though technically it's not supposed to be in here. Have you noticed that? You know, we're supposed to be talking about oscillations and mechanical waves, but not, not sound and strings, membranes, etc., bars. It, but it's just natural because they're involved in sound production or sound detection. It's natural to talk about acoustics. 
So we're going to take this um, one step further here. And the first thing I need to say, and I don't think it's there, is let's, we have this circular membrane. We're going to stick, we're going to keep exploring the azimuthally symmetric modes, okay? Because those are the ones for sound production or sound detection, those are the major ones, all right? And I want to point out to you now something that we neglected before, is that if I have a, a, a disc here, and, I'm, and it's going like, let's just take the piston, let's just take a disc, let's imagine a disc right now, and it goes like this, it creates a compression in the air and that's going to propagate. When it goes like this, it creates an expansion. So you get this waves, the waves that are sent out. And typically here, as I said before, for a membrane, the wavelength in the membrane, which is comparable to the diameter or radius of the membrane, it's r roughly on that scale, is much less because the speed of waves is the speed of waves is much less than the speed of sound. So when this thing is going like this, and there's there's a going, getting back to the membrane here, it's going like this. We have a characteristic roughly one wavelength here. The wavelength of the sound is huge because the speed is so much greater. Okay, so that led to what I was saying before, telling you before. If you have a dipole source, it is going to tend to be can the sound is going to tend to cancel. The amplitude will be way down. But let's look at a disc here. What happens with a disc? Compression, fine. What's happening behind the disc? So what does that mean? This expansion, does it just propagate this way? No, any waves, when the wavelength is large, they bend around um, obstructions. Waves diffract. Right? So, I mean, you can have a wall between two people. Partial wall, and you can talk to each other, right? So the waves, even in... It gets a little complicated because of reflections. But even if there were no reflections, you can talk to somebody on the other side of a wall if there's an opening here, right? Because, because of diffraction. And the longer the, the longer the wavelength, the greater the diffraction. So what we usually do for kids is when we do demos, we do this. <laughs> we do acoustics demos. So somebody talking here, sends out a sound wave, but that sound wave just diffracts, it bends. For very small wavelengths, it just, you, just, you get a nice shadow here. Like a laser, you're going to get a nice shadow. There will be a little bit of diffraction, but not as much as sound. It's because of the large wavelength. So getting back to the, what consequences they have for the piston here, the, excuse me, the disc. I just want to take a, a, a thin disc. It's going like this, it creates a compression, but there's an expansion back here. That expansion propagates here. How does it propagate slowly or quickly relative to what's going on here? Quickly, remember the speed of sound is much, typically much greater in the fluid than, in the, than what we're dealing with here, in the membrane. So there's going to tend to be cancellation. So this is not a, what we call a monopole source, because I'm not really changing the volume here, am I? I've got this thin disc and I'm moving it like this, Am I changing a volume? <laughs> so how do we get around that? We put an enclosure here. All right, so we're going to, um, when we do that, now instead of a disc, you want to, we can get back to the membrane here. It's going like this in the fundamental mode. Now, uh, I've, I've gone from a dipole, when something's moving like this, where the sound will tend to cancel from here and here to a monopole where it's not going to cancel. So that, as I'll demonstrate for you next quarter, you get much bigger amplitude. The application here is kettle drums, also known as timpani, okay, and microphones. You're using it to pick up on sound. Um, okay, so we can actually, we're going to go through this calculation right now, okay? The effect of this enclosure Oh, and, oh, this is, I should have written this. This is a rigid, uh, rigid shell here. This right here. We're going to assume that it's a rigid, that it acts like it's rigid. And we'll have um, air in here and air out here. Same fluid. Have some equilibrium pressure. Okay, so we're going to imagine now, and we'll just, we can just imagine the fundamental right now. 
but the Siri, well, the Siri will cover probably all of the azimuthal m equals zero modes. So what what do you expect here? What's going to happen? The first we've already been we've got we've already established the first thing. The, the first thing is, is that when I'm creating a compression right here, there's no expansion that's going to cancel it. So we've turned the dipole into a monopole. That's the most important thing. The next thing is this. What's how's the what's going to what's going to happen? What's going to change here? When this is going down, it compresses the gas inside here. When it's going up, it expands. So there's a greater stiffness. So what's going to happen to the normal modes? Anybody? <laughs> the frequency is going to go up. We've added the stiffness. Okay. So it's like the tuning fork in lab two with the eraser. I hope everybody got that. It's not a big effect, but it's significant. It's beyond any error. Okay. The damping went. Yeah, the quality factor went way down. But something else happened, and what was it? The frequency went up. Right, it's stiffer. We've added stiffness to the system. So we know that's going to happen. Okay. Um, how do we, um, how, so how do we calculate that? Well, we're going to make an approximation here. We're going to get, again, utilize this typical fact that the speed of sound is much greater than the speed of waves on the membrane, which means that the wavelength in the gas, the sound wavelength, is much greater than the characteristic wavelengths on the membrane. So what that means is, and you can look at this from a variety of ways, when there's, when the membrane is going down like this, there's a compression, right? Maybe the easiest way to think of it is, you don't have to, you don't actually don't have to bring in the wavelength. If the speed of sound is so big here, what's going to happen to the pressure here? It's all going to go up, essentially instantly, because the speed of sound is so fast. So the pressure, because the speed of sound is so fast, the pressure stays uniform. That's the key thing. And that's going to allow us to calculate this. Without that, this would be a nasty calculation. So we have, even though we have waves on here, we see, you know, we can have any, any azimuthally symmetric mode we want to here. The compression and expansion here, because the speed of sound is greater, and equivalent, you can think of the wavelength. Another way to look at it is, well, the wavelength's so big, it's, there's going to be uniform pressure here. It's equivalent to what I was just saying about the speed of sound. So we just have to deal, it's essentially quasi-static here. As far as the gas is going, the pressure change is uniform. It's quasi-static because our frequencies in the membrane are so, are so low. So in this case, how do we describe changes in the volume and the pressure? Well, they're adiabatic. Some of you may remember this. If you don't, don't worry about it. We're going to do it. We got to do it for sound. This is fundamental to sound. And it's described by, there's this inverse relationship between pressure and volume. The greater the pressure, the less the volume, or, and vice versa. But there's this factor of gamma here, the ratio of specific heats, that comes about because when we compress and expand here, we're not allowing any heat. There's no heat flow that's allowed to come in and go out. That's typically the case for sound, and we'll talk about that next quarter. Let's just assume it here. So this is just along for the ride here. PV to the gamma is equal. Some of you might remember this from high school. Do you remember high school? Ideal gas law. So this is not the, yeah, people usually remember the ideal gas law. In high school chemistry, right? This is not the ideal gas law. This is, describes an adiabatic transformation where there's no heat coming, going to the outside or coming in. PV to, is equal to a constant. That's an isothermal. So that would get, that would caps, comes from the ideal gas law. But this takes a little bit more effort to get this. PV to the gamma is equal to a constant. You usually memorize it from, or remember from two legs of the Carnot cycle, right? <laughs> Um, yeah, the Carnot cycle assumes an adiabatic, right? Yeah. Yeah, if that works so for you. Thermals, yeah. Right. Yeah. The, okay. I'm, I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Whether whether it's isothermal adiabatic can make a huge difference. Okay. One of them is this that that Alex is talking about is a famous Carnot cycle. It's an example, the simplest engine, and it operates alternately the legs of it isothermal and 
adiabatic. It makes, it makes a big difference. Newton thought sound was isothermal. And he was off by like 15% or something, which was measurable at the time. You can measure the speed of sound. You can go outside and make a, some sound and somebody sees you doing this and they time how much before they hear it. Is that allowed? Is, is it allowed? No, is that allowed? Oh, <laughs> no. But you'll do it in the modern, for those of you who take modern physics, you'll do it in modern physics for light. It's a lot harder to measure because it's a lot faster. But sound is really not that fast. You can measure. So they could have done that at the time. We'll talk about this more next quarter. But Newton was off. I don't, I don't know if anybody told him, you know, wanted to <laughs> incur his wrath. Yeah. But <laughs> okay, so anyway, once we know, now we've set the stage here. We can, we can crank on this. We can do a calculation. We've got to find the pressure change, because that's going to influence the membrane, that, that pressure change. And, but it's a uniform pressure. It's given by this adiabatic expression here. So we look, and this pressure change is going to be small. It's going to be incredibly small, as we'll see next quarter. The, the pressure changes you hear from my voice right now are really small. You will be amazed. Right? So this is a fine, it's a fine to make a differential, use a differential here has to be really loud to start to see differences. So we just look at what we call first order changes here. And, and the point of all this is we know what the volume change is. We just calculated that. That's the average displacement. That's what, we can get this from our average displacement calculation. So the change in pressure is proportional to the, this, this is this average displacement here. So, how do, we, how do we describe how that's going to affect the membrane? Well, we have to modify, I should have written this, we, we, need to have, we, to, we need to modify the wave equation, okay? So that's what we need to do next. Now this is the wave equation for the membrane waves. Before, when we derived the wave equation for membrane, we found, remember this, this is the this is the uh, force on a little area, on a little patch. There's the area, and this is the force. That we, we derived this. It was basically a string, two, you know, perpendicular strings. It's extension of string theory into two dimensions. But if you look back, you'll see this is the tension preno length. Remember that? I know you remember this, because, well, anyway. Um, so here's the force on the patch. Here's the mass of the patch, right? Obviously, the mass per unit area times the area, and there's the acceleration. So this is what we had before. Now we have an additional force. It's the force due to this pressure. And so that's going to sit on a little patch here. We have to multiply by the pressure, which is precisely this. The force is the pressure. The pressure is the force per unit area, so we multiply the pressure, which is this right here, including the minus sign, we multiply by the area. So we've now just added another term to our wave equation. This led to the standard wave equation. And now we've it's now going to be modified. And here it is. It's a nice, better form right here. Cancel the, the areas, the differential area. So again, here's what we derived before. Now we have a modification due to the, um, the pressure in the enclosure here. And this is a, this is weird, it does happen in applications. It's, is this a differential equation? Well, yeah, but it's more, isn't it, too? I mean, why is our unknown here? It's got an integral in it, so it's called an integral differential equation. And these do arise, this is not the only case, of course, where they arise. So, how do we solve this? You know there's going to be a way to solve it, otherwise we wouldn't be talking about it, right? But, all right. Um, so the way to solve it is, we need to solve this equation here. Um, uh, I don't know why I wrote this. This is not right. M does not equal, the, the M equals zero are the azimuthal modes. God.
Let me make a note about this. The non-azimuthal modes, okay, the modes that where m is not equal to zero, what's, what's going to what's gonna happen if we use, solve this equation for them? It works, this equation works. What's this going to be? What's, it's zero. So imagine the sloshing mode, you know, that the m is equal to one mode. Because that looks like this. So the average displacement here is going to be zero. So the frequency is not going to change. There's no effect. So it's going like this, and you know this is compressing the air. This is expanding, and they exactly cancel. That's going to be hold true for all of the non-azimuthal modes. The m does not equal zero modes. So we solve it. What do we mean by solve it? Well, we mean we want to look at the normal modes, and we know physically that for the m is equal to zero modes, the frequencies is stiffer, the frequencies have got to go up. The question is how much, precisely how much. So we hunt for, here's our search for normal standing wave modes, right, definite frequency. We substitute this in to our modified wave equation, we get this. We define, we use omega is equal to ck. So we're after the frequencies here, but it's convenient in the solution, as you know, to deal with k. So k is our unknown here, and the spectrum of k is going to tell us this frequency spectrum. So we get an equation that looks like this. Um, the, uh, oh, we can reduce this. We can do one of the integrations here. Because we have azimuthal symmetry, we can just write it like this, as we discussed before. Okay, that's good. Now, so the way to solve this is to think is to stop and think about it. Suppose we had no enclosure. Oh, no enclosure means either it's infinite volume or zero pressure. You can think of it either way. This this is gone. Okay, for no enclosure. We know what the solution is here. It's this Bessel function here. J0, because of, of KR. That's going to solve this equation with zero on the right side. So if you look at this, you can see this doesn't depend upon um, R. It gets integrated out here. There's no R. So it's natural, but it can be a function of K, especially because we have K here, which is unknown. So it's natural to try this as a solution. Here's, we know that this is going to satisfy, no matter what k is, we haven't imposed boundary conditions yet, no matter what k is, we know that this satisfies this equaling zero. This is a solution to the, wave the standard wave equation in two dimensions. So it turns out this will work, as we will see. Okay, it's, you know, it's, this is sort of, you can think of this as an ansatz, right? It's justified by the fact that we, it, we, it works in the end. All right, well, it's convenient here to go ahead and get rid of the boundary condition. We can get, at this point, we can actually get rid of the boundary condition. We have to have psi equals zero when r is equal to a. That's going to force what this function is. So it's going to have to be this. Remember, it's, a, it's an arbitrary, we're treating it as an arbitrary function of k. So this is a function of k, and this is the only function that's going to give us zero when r is equal to a, as you can see just by looking at this. When r is equal to a, we get zero. So the next thing we need to do is we want to solve for k, show that we can have, we have solutions for k, and that'll give us our, our, fre our frequency spectrum. So we plug this into the modified wave equation. And we're going to get some cancellate, you know, the, the J0 of KR, when we do this combination, it gives zero, so it simplifies. And here's what we get. We get um, this part here. The left-hand side collapses down to this, just this contribution here. This, <coughs> the wave operator, gives us zero on this. <coughs> Excuse me. So we get this, and then we get something that looks ugly here, right? On the right-hand side, we've got to do this integral. So 
Um, the first thing you want to do is go dimensionless. That's what I've done from here to here. I've gone to that X again. I transformed the arguments, all of these variables and R into X, and we have to transform the upper limit too. It gets transformed to this dimensionless value Ka. And we get this, and uh, can, you, can everybody do this integral? Yeah, because there's no x here, so it's one half x squared. Evaluated the limits, that's easy. Here, x times this, well, we used our same identity before. So you crank through this. Let me save a little bit of time. This is just straightforward math here. You want to be really careful with it. And then the final step, we get this, and look what this is equal to. You can cancel this. Has anyone ever seen that before? Well, you can guess where you could find it. You know, right? <laughs> this is uh, an example of what's called a recursion relationship. That J, Jn, a Jn can be determined in terms, a Jm can be expressed in terms of lower order Jms, for l smaller values of m. So it turns out this is an exact relationship among Bessel functions is that uh, J2 is equal to 2 times J1 over the argument minus J0. That's an exact relationship, one of the many relationships. So that's nice. So in the end, we get, putting, bring everything together, we get this, and now if we simplify, we get this. And now what we're going to do is, you want to notice something here. Ka is, of course, dimensionless, right? So this is dimensionless. J is dimensionless, dimensionless argument here. This B quantity here has to be dimensionless, and you can confirm that. And it's, we collect all of, this, all of these quantities into, this, into B here. All of these additional parameters due to the enclosure are in this B here. The radius, the ambient, the, or equilibrium pressure, and the equilibrium volume. It's all in here. There's that gamma, the ratio of specific heats. All right, and as a check here, when B is equal to zero, look what we get. When B is equal to zero, remember we want to solve this for K. <clears throat> when B is equal to zero, we're just solving J zero of K equals zero. That's going to give us our spectrum that we found in the past. The roots of the best of J zero. That's going to give us a possible frequency. So it checks in that case. Okay, so this is from the book. This calculation's in the book, okay? Um, Here's different values of the dimensionless parameter B. And uh, this has to be, of course, this has, this has to be done at this point, <coughs> has to be done numerically. Okay, and you can do it. The book has, t we have tables of Bessel function values in the book, so we can actually do it from tables. A more modern way is just go on the internet and you can, you know, you can get it, I'm sure. So for different values of B here, in increments of five, this is no enclosure. You'll rec you may recognize these numbers. These are the, this is when there's no enclosure. Those are the zeros of the Bessel function we dealt with before. Uh, for five, is, and get this, we get, these are going up. So the first thing you want to notice here is that these are increasing. What does that mean? What's the effect of the enclosure? Here there's no enclosure. Here there's some kind of enclosure. It's this dimensionless strength of five. What's happened to the frequency? Omega is equal to CK, so what's happened to the frequency? It's gone up. It has to, because of stiffness, increased stiffness. And you see it's marching upward here. How is it compared to here? Now, what, what's this mode? Remember this mode? This is the, um, this is this mode. Looks something like this. All right. So here we have, in the motion of the membrane, there's competition. If, if my enclosure is down here, and this one's coming out, that's going to tend to cause a lowering of the pressure. But what's, what's happening in this annulus here? It's causing an increase of pressure. So there's competition. And sure enough, look what, what, what effect do we expect it to have on the frequency? Less than over here. And look at this. Definitely less, way less. Yeah, so this has, that makes qualitative sense. 
Okay, any questions so far? All right, so let me begin this. So this could be useful for microphones because a typical microphone is a capacitor where one of the plates is a metallic or coated, metallic coated membrane. So you change the sound wave changes the capacitance, you can pick up the voltage. We'll, we'll talk about this <coughs> in later courses in the sequence, right? Um, so that's one possible application here. Another really interesting one is t these kettle drums or timpani. Has anyone ever seen these? Orchestras have these. There's usually four. They're copper, or they used to be copper. I don't know why. There's probably a reason. And there are big different sizes, right? There are these membranes with different sizes. And they can tune them. How do they tune them? We, I think we talked a little bit about this before. There's a pedal down there that changes the tension on the, on the membrane. There's a, when you push the pedal or one way or the other, it, it um, moves this rim up or down. It'll tighten or loosen the membrane. So you, you tune them. You can tune them. And they sound pretty good. Can anyone play back in their head? A, you know what a timpani sounds like? You guys, if you can't, you can go on the internet and, <laughs> and I'm sure you can hear it, right? <laughs> uh, it reminds me of a story, but I'm, don't worry, I'm not going to tell you. So anyway, um, we might wonder, this, we did this great theory here, we were able to do all these calculations and, and, and beat, not, it was only until the end that we had to actually do a numerical solution right at the end here to get these values. We might wonder what, um, what effect this has on kettle drums, okay, or timpani. Well, um, the answer is very surprising. And the answer is, this theory really doesn't matter. <laughs> and I was really surprised at this. And I, I've never really come to grips with this, and I still don't know a lot of it. But um, I looked into it a little more this time through the course. It turns out for, for kettle drum, they have these mallets, right? And they hit it. The, as mutually symmetric modes, either tend not to be excited or they damp out pretty quickly. I don't know which. KFCS doesn't tell us. But it's known. If you want to find out, you can. Okay, there's been a lot of work done on musical acoustics. And it's complicated. It's almost always complicated. But anyway, when we hear a timpani, we're actually not hearing it in the monopole mode. It's, it's a dipole or higher order. It's probably a, a, a dipole type mode. Because the modes that are, play a roller are not the S, they're the, the M is equal to one, etc. modes, not the M equals zero. So that, that's a big surprise. And I, I don't know of any other cases like this. Almost always, we're going to spend, for example, next quarter, we're going to spend most of the quarter talking about monopole sources and receivers of sound because they're so important. And it turns out for kettle drums, it's, uh, it, it's, it's not, it's, that's minor. And there's another thing here, and this is all. Ha this all has to do with the fact that they don't. I'm sure it all ties together, because kettle drums, like any musical instrument, evolved over centuries, right? So it was just empirical, done empirically. Um, what's involved in the kettle drum? You can read this in the book. It's just it's incomplete, but they have some stuff. They make some statements in there. Um, what's involved with these higher modes, and it turns out, and I don't understand this either, but they're approximately harmonic, these higher modes. So this is one of the reasons that timpani, as opposed to other type, other type drums, if you imagine hearing a drum, they don't usually sound great, they don't ring a lot. The tone is, it's, sometimes it's hard to, to identify a pitch, right? I think that's because they're not harmonic. The, the higher modes there are not, are not harmonic. For a timpani, they are close to being harmonic. Somehow they've managed to arrange that. Somehow they've achieved that. They shouldn't be harmonic, but somehow they are. Anyway, you can, if you're interested, you can look in the book. And you can always come by and talk to me or send me a message about this. I'm always, it'd be nice to learn more about this stuff. But to be honest with you, I've already had my experience with musical acoustics a couple decades ago. I did some research in it and published a few papers. 
And I said, okay, that's it. I'm no more musical acoustics. Because it is incredibly complicated. It's incre yeah, I have to tell you this. You're not going to really know this until you actually have to deal with it or look into it deeper. But if anybody gets interested in this you want to talk about it, please let me, let me know, okay?